So, our last speaker. Um, the man I have the pleasure of introducing is somebody who radiates passion for liberty. His start in the movement as a volunteer for the Ludwig von Mises Institute to his current array of obligations was made possible through compassion and hard work, which is a message he'll share with us today in his speech, Your Life is What You Believe. It is my pleasure to introduce our next speaker, the Director of Content for the, for the Foundation of Economic Education and the author of a multitude of books, including his most recent work, Right Wing Collectivism, The Other Threat to Liberty. His message today is so valuable and so worthwhile, and I'm very thankful that he's here to share it with us. Please join me in welcoming Jeffrey Tucker. Thank you so much. I appreciate that very much. Uh, I love that last speech, right? It was wonderful. I'd like to send Tom Palmer on an international tour giving this similar speech all over the world. Wait, you did that, actually, right? So it was absolutely brilliant. I hope you listened carefully to what he said. Um, if I had known that 25 years ago, I'd be much better off than, than I was. It was a wonderful talk in so many respects. So really, much of what I'll be doing today is fleshing out some particulars of that talk with less brilliance and less systematic organization. So hopefully you're okay with that. So here we go. Um, uh, I think I called the talk uh, something like, what you believe is matters for your life, or something like that. And I, 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 I said that sentence because uh, because it really does. You need to get straight what it is you think about the world, who you are, and uh, the role that you play within it. It really does matter. Uh, you need to kind of get intellectually responsible. You're all old enough and ready to do that. Uh, think seriously about <laughs> about your place within um, uh, within your friendship network, within your family, within your community, within within the political realm. And the reason it's really important that you think through this is that we live in times when you are being buffeted all over the place constantly by forces asking you to do something other than the right thing. Now, by the right thing, I mean in this case to uh, adopt a mindset very similar to what uh, Professor Palmer laid out to be a liberal. The uh, reason I didn't call, uh, call the talk, uh, you know, in the, in the paper something about liberalism or how to be a good liberal, or as I call it here, 12 Habits of the Liberal Mind, is that people these days don't understand what that term means, and I think it's really tragic. Because we've lost the term liberalism, and s to some extent, although not entirely, and I'm working my, my heart is to bring it back. I will never use the word liberal as a synonym for statism or leftism or rightism or something like that. It really is a different thing. And I, I have my doubts about the term libertarianism. I think it sounds too clinical and a little bit uh, too dogmatic and a little bit too Cartesian and rationalistic. It implies somehow that we've got a plan for the world. I mean, you notice how people are sort of weirdly afraid of libertarianism? They're afraid of libertarianism. Oh, you're a libertarian? I mean, they're afraid you're going to do something bad to them. Well, like, what? No, it's the opposite. But how much can we actually explain this? I mean, words mean what they mean in the here, you know? And I have my doubts about this, the, 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 the term libertarian. I don't, I mean, I'm glad to call myself that. Actually, if I call myself my ideal term, it would be liberal anarchist, right? That, that's what I would be glad to call that. But when you talk about adding confusion to confusion, <laughs> liberal anarchist, you know. Does that mean you throw a lot of bombs? You know, I don't know. Um, uh, but I do want to take back the term liberalism, and, and, and a part of the reason for that is that it allows us to talk about history in a way that libertarianism does not. Now think about this. This term libertarianism was first uttered in the post-war period in 1956 um, in the magazine that, that I'm currently the successor editor to, the Freeman, I am the continent of the Foundation for Economic Education. And they threw it out there because they felt like the word liberalism had been lost uh, during the war and during the New Deal and even, even before. And they felt like it couldn't be recaptured. I think they gave it up too soon. They, they posited libertarian as a synonym 
for liberalism. It didn't add anything new. It was just classical liberalism, traditional liberalism, repackaged in a new term. This term libertarianism had been left over. You know, this, this happens. Uh, the late 19th century socialist anarchists threw it around a lot, and then they just went away. So about 60 years went by when nobody was really using the term. So these guys in the post-war period just found it on the shelf and said, why don't we use this? But I think it's introduced a lot of confusions because we can't really talk about history. You know, like Tom Palmer talked about the, our ideas as related to, um, to John Locke, you know, Thomas Jefferson, going uh, all the way back to the late Middle Ages, successors of Thomas Aquinas, and even uh, to various ancient Chinese philosophers. Well, if we're using the term libertarian to describe ourselves, it's very difficult to understand uh, you know, this tradition in light of that term. It's just it's a weird application. The other problem I have with it is that the United States is the only country in which the word libertarian means what you and I mean with it. So just keep, keep this in mind when you talk to people from Argentina or Spain or even England. Uh, the word libertarian means something different there than it means here. Whereas the word liberalism means something everywhere, and mostly the correct thing, with the exception of the United States. You know? So you know, liberalism has meaning all over the world. So I, I've begun to use liberal uh, in the correct way. I live in Georgia, so it gets me in trouble all the time. right? I'm always using the correct as a gun store. And, and I was asking the guy about, because uh, he was advertising that I could use an automatic weapon. I thought, well, isn't that strange? I don't know if you could actually do it. He goes, oh, no, it's, the laws changed. The Clinton ban went away. And now you can use an automatic weapon you know, here at the range. Uh, and I said, oh, so the law was liberalized. And he was stunned. He said, I don't know what you're talking about, but I ain't no liberal. <laughs> <laughs> I said, well, no, nah, I don't mean like you're a liberal. That's I mean, uh, it's just that like we're freer than we used to be. Because well, I don't know what you mean, but I ain't no liberal. So you know, you get into, <laughs> this, into these problems. Anyway, so liberalism occupies. Yeah. Why not say classical liberal? Oh, uh, it's too much of a word. Uh, yeah, the problem with classical liberal, I think, is that it sounds too classical. Like you know. <laughs> Like, you're, you want to go back to uh, a time of, I don't know what, you know, it's Greek statues or, you know, big pillars on building, I don't know, but, you know, just um, oil paintings or I don't know what it is. It's just a little too classical sounding to me, whether you like Brahms a lot or something. You know, so a traditional liberal, I don't mind so much, but traditional liberal also has a strange connotation, too, because the word traditionalism itself is awkward. So, and it's like liberal, it's just liberalism. I mean, it's what we believe. So, here, here's the thing I would like to convince you of that liberalism occupies a distinct place in the history of ideas that's distinct from left and right. Now, that sounds very easy to say. It's very hard to put into practice because every day we're constantly badgered day in and day out on Facebook and Twitter and everything you read, you turn on the news, you've got to either watch CNN or Fox. You guys have a problem with that? I mean, I'm getting tired of this, right? It's like you have to flip between channels to find out. One's a right-wing view, one's a left-wing view. You're like, where's my view? You know? Where's the sort of the normal position that people should be le uh, le left alone to do whatever they want and, and build a, a beautiful society? I mean, does it, nobody accept this? Or what, you know, this happens every day. You know, like uh, all, at 8 a.m., I'll post something against Trump, and people go, well, would you really have Hillary? You know, it's like, I'm, OK, I didn't. That was then, that, you know, I'm just, I'm just talking about the truth, right? And then a couple hours later, I'll post something that'll be pro-Trump, you know, something he did that was right. And then people will say, oh, I thought he was a Nazi. You know, no, you're pretty, it's like, dude, you know, this is about principles, all right? It's not about people. It's not about having to occupy some tribal category, you know? Uh, we should be able to speak our minds, and even if it doesn't fit entirely with left and right. But you know what's interesting about our lives? Um, I think there's a growing place for liberalism in, in public life today. Uh, because, precisely because, the left and the right have both become so preposterous and tribalized and uh, annoying, you know, in every conceivable way, that uh, it really does cry out for a third alternative. In some ways, um, I think what we're, where we're heading to 
And maybe you notice this uh, in, in reading the press about the two parties, right? Like you read a headline that says, well, the Democrats are in disarray. Will they ever win, win another presidential election? And then the very next article will go, well, the Republican Party is collapsing. You know, what are they going to do? There's nothing left of these, of these guys. Well, both can be true. And it's, and it's happening all over Europe and happening all over Latin America. Where's our friend from Brazil? You know, uh, right? No, not Brazil. Uh, um, you're not from Brazil. Was anybody here from Brazil? No. I'm sorry. That was a terrible mistake. Mea culpa. Um, but, you know, in Brazil, all existing political parties are unpopular, you know? And it's happening in Germany. Uh, it's not that many people actually like the alternatives to the right, but they're desperately looking for an alternative to the left, you know? So it's, you know, we've, we've got all political systems sort of collapsing. And what the world needs right now is courageous individuals with a, a clear head and a good conscience to go out and just say, let us be free of all this nonsense. We've done it in the past. Uh, liberalism gave birth to the greatest movement in history that liberated, emancipated the human mind to create and build beautiful things. And it happened, as Tom showed in his chart, in an instant, in a flash, and glorious things happened to the world. It can happen again, because I think ideas really matter. In the 19th century, it's very common. You had three parties. You had labor, you had the Tories, and you had the liberals. All right? that was, that's a normal thing to have happen. You've got one side that represents a sort of hierarchical, conservative view that wants, wants to roll back the world, to restore hierarchies, old technologies, the old elites. And then you've got the, uh, the labor or the socialists who imagine that giving more power to the state will create more redistributive justice, give more rights to workers, and so on. One left represents the right, one left represents the left. The liberals are always the third choice. So I think you can be that. You can be the, the, the liberal. Um, this is what makes is to me awkward about the term libertarian. You describe yourself as libertarian. Everybody thinks, oh, you're uh, one of those weird niche dudes that likes Rubik's Cubes and Bitcoin. <laughs> 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 now, granted, you would far rather I be talking about Bitcoin today than what I'm about to talk about. <laughs> I know you guys. You love Bitcoin. <laughs> now, we can talk about that a little bit later. But we are not a niche interest. That's my main point. We represent a broad swath of humanity that just wants to be left alone. Our achievements in history are legion. It was liberalism that put an end to the religious wars and first imagined the possibility that you could have this weird system in which you pretty much leave people alone to believe whatever they want to believe, so long as they don't interfere with other people's belief systems. Not everybody has to have the, uh, the same religion, it turns out. And wow, the system worked. And that was an awesome discovery, you know, in the high Middle Ages. An awesome discovery to find out you didn't have to have a single ecclesiocracy or theocracy. It was the first time liberalism had ever been tried out. It was to grant people freedom to believe and worship how they, how they, how they um, uh, you know, whatever they wanted. So you didn't have, you, wouldn't, you weren't going to get hung from the gallows because you had doubts about transubstantiation, for example. You can believe in consubstantiation and still hold on to your life. That's an amazing new system. And so then it began to get rolled out more and more. Well, that, that kind of freedom worked. Why don't, we, why don't we try another one? Why don't we let people uh, uh, print whatever they want and read whatever they want? There doesn't seem to be any grave damage there. What about if people are allowed to speak? And uh, the same way. And uh, what if we let people trade, you know, trade across borders and not stop trade at, at the borders? You know, let's just see how far we can go with this freedom. What if we let people just all start businesses and we eliminate business cartels too? We don't have to have <coughs> always the king approving or disapproving of every single new business or every new technology or every, every, every new religion. The more freedom we had to roll out in the world, the better and more beautiful the world became. And then by the 19th century, things went crazy. The Napoleonic Wars ended. Uh, uh, there was a big movement in, in Europe and the United States against the idea of war, the possibility of peace and prosperity. And, and for the first time, people began to imagine something unthinkable. I, I, it's, it's hard to imagine this. Something unthinkable, that we could eliminate slavery. 
eliminate slavery from the world, that every human being is deserving of full rights and dignity, you know? and that nobody had to be owned by another. Now, this was a scandal to guys like Thomas Carlyle, right? He was one of the early fascist thinkers who wrote on heroism and a heroic in history. He said, what kind of world is that? Uh, a world where, without slavery? That's a world without greatness, without courage, without conquest. It's going to be dreadfully boring. People just trading, everybody having equal rights. And that's, we can't have that kind of world. And he battled it out with a group of liberals in 19th century uh, Britain, most of whom were economists. And he was so annoyed by the persistent demands of the economists that we could eliminate slavery that he said, look, this science you call economics, you know, it's really just a dismal science. Right? That's why he called econ e economics a dismal science, because it, it, the liberal economists imagined a world without slavery. They said a world without slavery would be dismal. But we achieved it. We got it. And then the next frontier came. Something that no one in the history of the world had ever imagined possible, which was that women would actually be permitted to exercise full human rights and be regarded as normative human beings for the first time in history. You talk about radical. It's one thing to eliminate slavery, another thing to what? Grant half the human race actual rights? Women? We're going to do this? We're going to do it? So the whole movement for, for women to have equal uh, legal rights and be considered normative human beings began with liberalism. John Stuart Mill and his great book, book on the end of the subjection of women was written after, what, in the 1840s or something like that? Hugely controversial. But sure enough, 50 years later, it was largely achieved. And the permanent regime of misogyny institutionalized throughout human history came to a crumbling and that was the achievement of liberalism. We won that victory. We emancipated the slaves. We brought about free speech. We brought about freedom of religion. All these achievements were brought around because people believed in something new, in something awesome, the possibility that society could manage itself. So I think that we should all feel great pride in our history and claim it, believe in it, and be dedicated to bringing it into the 21st century in a full way, in the midst of the collapse of all the prevailing paradigms. And make no mistake about it, the other paradigms are collapsing. The left for one reason, the right for another reason. We can go into that. It's baked into, the, into, in, into this. Um, right now, in the, recent German, in the recent European elections, for example, the social democratic center left parties all lost more seats in parliaments than that have been lost since World War II. And there's absolutely no future to social democracy, center-left politics as we know it. And that's for particular reasons of demographics and the impossibility of, of these systems to actually work correctly. So now we're experimenting with something new. The rise of the alt-right in Europe, the rise of Trump in the US, and in particular the Trumpist sort of movement which is a sort of mirror image of the Sanders movement and the social democratic left. They're attempting to sort of recreate this in a different cultural rubric. One of the things that profoundly disturbed me uh, over the last couple of years is that when Trump came along and the Trump movement came along and the traditional Republican belief in free trade and free migration and limited government suddenly flipped out of nowhere and you've suddenly got Republicans going, yeah, Kick out, kick, kick out all these foreigners, we've got to get rid of them. Uh, trade is ruining the country. What we need is a CEO of our society to shape us up and manage us well. That people did not recognize the origins of this ideology because nobody had really encountered it since World War II. And unfortunately, it's the nature of the human mind to only know things that go on in your generation and maybe a little bit from your parents. But beyond that, we got huge gaps in knowledge and understanding. So what everybody knew uh, all the liberals knew at the end of World War I that we faced threats to our freedom from both the left and the right suddenly you know, had by this time gone completely away. Which is why my new book is called Right Wing Collectivism, The Other Threat to Liberty. So if you haven't downloaded it, it's like three bucks on Amazon. You should go get it. What I attempt to do 
is trace out this alternative form of statism that emerged in the early 19th century and built itself over the course of, of the 19th century as an alternative, as a way, as a revanchist attempt to reverse laissez-faire, reverse the gains of liberalism. I mean, make no mistake about it, that is exactly what this rightist collectivist ideology wants to do. It wants to turn back the clock uh, uh, to, to a, a time's past. I mean, there's a reason, and by the way, People get confused about this. I, it's not my view that Trump is well read, right? <laughs> right? Um, so when I say, but here's the thing all existing politicians are unwitting slaves of dead philosophers. They all are. They may not know it, but they are. And within Trump's movement, and I would say this about all the right-wing parties in, in Europe today, um, they are channeling this tradition of thought. It's anti-leftist, but it's not enough to be anti-leftist. You have to be pro-freedom. The question is, where do you stand on freedom? That's the issue. And there is an alternative tradition that we just didn't know about. My book goes into it, but it, it goes from, from, uh, from Hegel. Uh, and the Hegelians broke into left and right wing branches depending on your view of the Prussian state and the Prussian, Prussian church. Uh, the left wing branch ended up in, in Marx, and the right wing branch ended up in Hitler, all right? The, the, the systems and structures they create in the end are not that much different, but they're sold under different the cultural uh, rubrics, and they have different policy priorities. So what, I, what my book attempts to do is trace out this rightist tradition of statism all the way from 1820 up into World War II. And the reason I did that is because I think we need to get better at training our instincts, you know? So when somebody stands in front of you, you're able to smell the status. That's the thing. <laughs> not, not to be confused and go, ha, huh, that's a kind of random idea. I've never really thought about that. No, you know. And you know exactly where it's headed, right? We're controlled by, uh, we're unwitting slaves of these dead philosophers. We need to get good at recognizing them. The purpose of my book is to sort of train you. And I know I keep mentioning Tom Palmer. This book would not have been possible without his, without his tutelage and, uh, and helping me understand more about it. Because he's been studying this. He was alert to this a lot uh, before, long before I was. Um, I'm also very much indebted to Ludwig von Mises, who I think it was my mentor. I never met him. I was nine years old when he died. But I keep going back to his works, because his works are sprinkled with these breadcrumbs everywhere that you're able to trace out. I'll mention a name. Um, you know, uh, uh, somebody like, um, um, well, you know, he mentions somebody like, uh, uh, there's a guy who wrote The Decline of the West. Spengler. Spengler. I mentioned Spengler. And so then I'll start reading Spengler. I'm like, oh, OK, yeah. Then we, we have a classic right Hegelian, you know? Uh, uh, with his nationalism or in omnipotent government, you know, he mentions uh, the thought of Ernst Renan, you know, who wrote, gave, gave a great lecture in 1880 in France on nationalism, on a liberal theory of nationalism. I'm able to go back and pull it up and read it and learn, you know, what it is our tradition believes. We are all kind of, I don't know, ideological archaeologists at this point, you know. They, we've been dropped into this weird world, 2017, cut off from the, into our intellectual heritage. Uh, separated by so many decades from the thought that we need to embrace, uh, we should all think of ourselves as ex like excited explorers to look through this tradition, find out what's wrong, find out what's right, get a consistent worldview, and put it together. Um, because I believe that it's the future, and there's a reason you're here today, because you have been, uh, for whatever reason, selected to be a master of these ideas, and you can do it. Okay, so let me, uh, let me just kind of go through this list. I know there's 12 points. You think, oh, God, we're going to be here till midnight. It's not true. Um, what I did was I tried to think of all the ways that you might be able to anticipate, if you properly study the liberal tradition, the ways you will begin to think that will be personally beneficial towards you, to you, um, and the, the ways you would think that would make you different from your friends and your neighbors, but also inspire people to, uh, to possibly follow in your way. The first one is that knowing the right way is a discovery process. Now, you think about it. Every single central plan 
that, that the left or the right offers is premised on the idea that they know exactly the way to live. They know all the technologies that shouldn't ex should exist, all the things that shouldn't exist, or the drugs you should take, the things you should take, the age at which you're supposed to start working, how many gallons of water should be in your toilet tank, uh, where you're allowed to travel, where you're not allowed to travel. They're, they all have a model for your life. And they're all premised on the idea that they know what's true, and their convictions are so firm, and they're so correct about this, that they're willing to use force to bring it about. <coughs> Liberals, in the classical sense, do not believe this. We think we have to have freedom in order to discover new things, to discover the right way uh, to live. You know, what industries should be profitable, which ones should not? What technology should come about, which ones should not? We don't know the answers. That's why we believe in a social process of constant experimentation, testing, and change. In other words, we want the Lego pieces, you want to be able to move them around on the board, or you want them glued down, like in the movie, right? You don't want the Lego pieces glued, you want them to be free to move so that we can discover the right way. The state does not think this way. I don't know. Let me give you an example. Uh, so how many of you know a smart young person at the age of, say, 12? I mean, I have an intern who's 13, and she's absolutely brilliant. OK, right? These people are not permitted to be paid for their work. To me, that is stupid. I'm a huge advocate and champion of child labor. Sorry, I have to just tell you the truth. I love it. I think every kid ought to be working from the age of, I don't know, 11? No, let's make it nine. It's seven. I don't care. Uh, I think people ought to be free to contract labor services with anyone of any age. I do. Now, subject to the parents, you know, uh, disapproval, whatever. But I mean, I, I couldn't wait to get to work. It just dro drove me crazy when I was 13 and 14 that I couldn't work. So I finally just started, you know, accepting cash under the table. And then, uh, then in those days, when I forgot my first job, I was able to lie. Hey, can you imagine? You can't do that now, right? But I went in, and they said, how old are you? I said, mm, oh, I'm uh, 16. They said, great. You know, get out on sales floor, get to work. <coughs> I was happy. I made money. It validated my humanity. I was able to be valuable to other people. That is a glorious thing. To be able to be valuable to another makes you feel valuable yourself. And what do we do with our kids now? We tell them, you suck. Sit in this chair. Listen to your teacher. Don't do anything. Just take in information and spit it back out on a test. We wonder why kids are demoralized these days. I mean, geez, it's no wonder. Because we don't let them obtain value in the marketplace. I don't like systems that freeze life in place, that make things static. Masters that tell us, no, it's exploitation for any child to work before the age of 16. And when you're 16, you cannot work anywhere around uh, a machine, for example. You know, because that would be terrible. Instead, you have to be out on the football field crashing into each other. You know, there's nothing dangerous about that. <laughs> I don't know. Um, another issue is like drugs, right? Oh, wait, drinking. You want to talk about drinking? What are we doing? I mean, we've got, we've got, you can't drink until you're 21? I mean, you don't believe that. I mean, I'm not going to ask for a show of hands, but I've been, I've heard that a lot of students today have fake ideas. Have you heard this? No. <laughs> wait, where are you? That's what they tell us. How dare they? Right? How dare they not use the government? Because they know. They know. So anyway, the first habit of a liberal mind is that you don't know, you don't know all the answers. That you believe in discovering the answers. F. A. Hayek said the most challenging thing, and I try to think about this every day. He said, if we know the way freedom would work, we wouldn't need it. At we have freedom in order to discover the right way that society should offer. That's an amazing paradoxical statement, but I love it. We have to have freedom to discover. It doesn't mean we're going to create utopia. Liberalism is not about creating utopias. It's about creating societies that are adaptive, creative, willing to admit error, can change based on your own action and beliefs. We want adaptive societies. Just like you adapt in your own life, we want society as a whole to be able to adapt and evolve and change. Okay. 
Uh, number two, 12 habits of liberal mind. Number two, skeptical of enforcement as a means of social management. You notice this, the state doesn't have any other means of managing anything other than to say more guns, more power, more jails, more police. How many police is too many police? You know, I mean, how about in your hometown? I mean, there's a, I, 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 I spent 20 years in Auburn, Alabama. When I first got there, it would seem to be more or less free. By the time I left, it was a totalitarian state. There were never enough police. There's nothing wrong with the law, according to the police, according to the state. It's always about not enough enforcement. So drugs, oh, more enforcement. Everything's more enforcement. Uh, we have to crack skulls, crack down, kick people around, control everything about their lives. Uh, this, this mentality the liberal completely rejects because we think that uh, we believe uh, with, uh, with Lady Gaga that uh, it's true that you can control my uh, that you can you, you, that you can control my body. You can you can do what you want with my body, but you can't control my mind. You can't control the way I think. You can't control my speech. Right? Uh, I'm certain that's what she meant by that lyric. <laughs> um, so the human mind is where the essential activity of human life takes place. Right here. I remember. I, I raised a little girl who's now uh, a professor, actually, uh, of music. And I, I, she got in trouble with me one time because I cracked down on her really hard. And I saw she was crying a little bit. I said, oh, sweet child, uh, let me just let you know uh, an interesting thing about life. Um, you kind of resent the fact that you have to do what I'm telling you to do right now, I know and you kind of hate me for it, but let me tell you something that I can't control. I can't control anything that's in your head. In fact, I can't even know what's in your head. Think about the freedom that that allows you. You can think whatever you want right now. As I looked at her, and this little mischievous smile went across her face. She suddenly felt herself to be free. They just think a father to tell a daughter to and she is very much free thinking, but it's just true. It's just true. Enforcement uh, is not uh, a way forward. We should be profoundly skeptical. Oh, you know, it's the same thing with war, right? We keep how long? How many years have we been losing the Iraq War? It's like a quarter century now, or something like that. It's like, well, what's the problem? Well, we need more shock and awe. You know, a few more boots on the ground. Uh, a few more bombs, uh, that'll fix everything. Oh, Afghanistan? Yeah, I know we've been there for 15 years, but uh, what we need is a new plan. Uh, we need to scare the hell out of them this time, you know? Or, or Trump's dealing with, with North Korea. Roar! We're going to blow you up. We're going to wipe North Korea off the map. I, you know, the effect of this, kind of, of this kind of language is actually to entrench the bad behavior, you know? I, I mean, you know, think about this in your own life, you know? Think about the most totalitarian order you ever received. Um, you, you resent it, you know? You, 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 you push back against it. It's, it's not a way of causing you to believe different things. It's just a way to cause you to resent and hate and plot at the next opportunity to do something bad, quote unquote. So a liberal mind is skeptical of enforcement as a means of social personal management. Number three, we're skeptical of tribes and tribal frenzies. You know, <laughs> the greatest threat to liberty from the Middle Ages up to the present has been hordes of group thinking, angry uh, masses on the march with pitchforks and um, Tiki tortures, OK? Um, we should worry about this kind of thing. It's not the way liberalism looks. Ludwig von Mises says in his great, great book, 1927, Liberalism, that true liberalism is not about uniforms and parades and songs and screaming and yelling and the masses on the move to overthrow the great enemy. Uh, that usually ends up in greater tyranny. It's about the ideas. It's about the the, the rationale, it's about the arguments, it's about cool, calm reason and thought. We're skeptical of tribes and tribes. The state always wants us to organize ourselves in terms of the tribes. Notice during, during elections, right? It's like, well, how are women voting? 
Now, well, how are uh, middle class uh, men voting? You know, how are how are lower class uh, white men voting? How are how are black how are black people going to vote? You know, what are we going to do about the Mexicans and so on? Everybody's clumped into these groups. I think this is very dangerous. As liberals, we believe in individualism, not tribalism. And in fact, I don't even like the language you sometimes use about ourselves. How's the liberty movement doing? I don't know. You know, I don't know. I mean, I understand we use that as a shorthand, but look, I'm, I, I'm, a, I'm a liberal, but I'm an individual. And I'm not a spokesman for any movement. And I don't think uh, our purpose here is to recruit you to be part of a movement. That's not how we play. That's not how we do, you know? Um, the, you know, the, the demographics of libertarians, according to this, uh, to many people are, are very predictable. I think, that's, I think that's, that's unfortunate. Liberalism is a creed, and it's a way of thinking that pertains to everybody. Not just people like me who own large amounts of cryptocurrency, okay? So it's, it belongs to the whole world. All right, uh, number four, we have confidence in ideas. We are unafraid of tanks and guns and authority figures and hierarchies and, and, and people telling us what to, what to believe and trying to force that down our throats. We believe that ideas ultimately run the world because it's true. Everything you see around you, every piece of physical property, every existing institution is a product of some idea that somebody had <coughs> in the past that became instantiated in the world around us. If you want to see the future, look inside your own heart, look inside your own mind. Those are the ideas you have. That's the world that is up to you to build. Ideas are portable. They're immutable. Uh, in one form. They're malleable and adaptable on the other. They can be infinitely shared and infinitely reproduced. You can't say the same thing about tanks and guns and bureaucracies. So therefore, ideas are far more powerful. We have in this room the most powerful weapons, all right? I mean, I wouldn't take the entire nuclear arsenal of the US over what we have in this room, which is intelligent, thoughtful, thinking people dedicated to making the world a better place. More powerful than anything else. OK. Uh, approve the unapproved. Now, this one's kind of difficult, because liberalism asks you to tolerate that which, of which you disapprove, at least temporarily, um, and, and, and believe that it should still be allowed to go on. Ideas that you reject. Uh, lifestyles that are not your own. Outlooks on life that you don't understand. And that's very difficult. That's very difficult. You know, I have friends of mine who are terrified somehow of Sharia law. Now, I don't know what that much about Sharia law, but I do know that most uh, religious legal codes are weirdly adaptive, right? So when the Catholics came over um, in the late 19th century, everybody was uh, then uh, scared of canon law. You know, the Catholics came over with their own court systems, their own structures of authorities. They were ridiculously deferential to this dude in Rome with a funny hat. And uh, they didn't much appreciate uh, American institutions. Um, and it caused widespread attack. So we can't, we can't have a country with people like this. But liberals said, well, you know, why don't we just let it play itself out and see what happens? And I think that's the right uh, approach that we should be using. Um, and I feel this, you know, we should train ourselves to feel this way about virtually everything. You know, we all encounter things, ideas we don't like. The question is, do you want to shut them down, or do you believe in the human right to practice, to adopt practices that, you, that are not mainstream? I think we should. As long as nobody is being physically harmed, we have to learn to celebrate things that, that values the right of values to exist and express themselves that, we, that are not necessarily ours. There's not a single person here in this room that has the same views about God, for example. <laughs> you know what? That's OK. Just because you allow other people around you to have different views doesn't compromise you. You're not uh, selling out. You're not being unprincipled. Uh, just because your neighbor believes in consubstantiation and you don't, that doesn't, that's not, that's not, there's no skin up. It's not a problem. Uh, number six, the habits of liberal mind, charity. Now, I like this word charity because it really comes from the Latin word caritas, which, which 
which is a synonym in English for the word love. Love, to me, is the very foundation of everything that takes place in a liberal society. It's the foundation of, it, it's, it's, love in, in a social sense just simply means finding value in other people and helping those people find value in you, to whatever extent. Now, there's many kinds of love. There's the, the love that comes from, from, from just, just a friendship. Uh, and, and, and it intensifies, if you read C.S. Lewis, you know it intensifies all the way to the most intimate forms of love. Free society unleashes love in the world more than anything else. It takes many forms. But every exchange, in a way, is an act of love or an act of charity. As Tom said, we say thank you, they say thank you. There's aspects of life that that's really very beautiful. How many of you in this room have been to jail? What? Oh, because uh, why? Uh, why? OK, yeah, street cred. I've been in jail twice. First time was tragedy, second time, uh, hilarious. Um, <laughs> anyway, I'm used to it now, right? The cop pulls me over. I know I'm going to be in cuffs in no time. Um, I mean, in this case, it was because I failed to pay a parking ticket or something. Um, second time was something about registration of some sort. Anyway. I'll never forget what it was like to be behind bars. Um, it was almost a metaphysical transformation that happened to me. Because I realized, and it just pains me even to think about it, but when you're behind bars, you're in a cage. And your humanity goes away. It doesn't matter that I've written seven books, you know, that I'm Jeffrey. My name doesn't matter. Jeffrey Tucker, who's that? You don't know who you are. Nobody cares. Anything you've ever done, anything you've ever loved, anything you've ever created, anything you've ever written, anything you've ever worked for, tried to do in your life, it's stripped away from you completely, and you're reduced to nothing but a consumer of stale sandwiches. That's who you are in jail. And you think, what about all the people who love me? There are many people who love me and value me in life. Where are they? to give me this value, they're not there. And they don't have any access to you, and you have no access to them. You are suddenly, instantly, as soon as the, 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 the bars close on the jail sale, taken away from everybody you love, and everybody you love is taken away from controlling you. That's a metaphysical transformation. And if it ever happens to you, you'll, you'll discover that you'll, you'll realize this within minutes from, and being behind the bar. It's a terrifying feeling be cut off from society. But there are some people who can control you. The warden and the guards and these kind of people, you try to get their attention, they're not going to give you the time of day, literally. What time is it? They look through you like you're just some mm, weird sound, just strange sounds are coming from this bag of flesh over there. And it just it sends chills right through you. All right? The reason why that's important is this. That's life without freedom. All of life, all of society is in jail if you take away freedom. If you take away one freedom, you're a little more in jail. Less opportunity to be loved, less opportunity to show love. Okay, number seven, I listed tolerance. Um, yeah, I think it's too similar to a proof and a fool, although tolerance is really important. We need to understand that different people act and behave different, differently and celebrate those differences. That, you know, that's the best thing. People always, you know, the all right always says this. Don't we need to live in a homogeneous society? You want to create homogeneity? Good luck. There's no such thing. There is no such thing as homogeneity. Find somebody with the same uh, uh, gender identity, race, language, religion, put you in a room long enough, you're going, to be, you're going to find differences between you. There's no such thing as homogeneity in this world. Heterogeneity is the beautiful thing in life. And the beautiful thing about freedom is that it finds ways for people who are different to get along with each other. That's the greatest thing about it. I mean, the alt-right is completely wrong about this point. You don't need homogeneous societies. Or if you had them, you wouldn't need freedom, right? The whole point of freedom is to find a way that people who are different can be valuable to each other. All right. Courage. Uh, <laughs> we have a lack of it, you know? I get it. I get it. 
Um, it can be very scary to speak your minds these days because there's always going to be somebody coming after you, especially as a dedicated liberal, because you're always going to be saying things that are slightly different, you know? When I say that I think children should have the freedom to work, people say, well, that's the most disgusting, horrifying view I've ever heard in my entire life. And, and by the way, the new Secretary of Education, what's her name? Uh, DeVos? Betsy DeVos. Yeah, Betsy DeVos. I really, she's a sweet woman, but um, she at some point uh, had, uh, I don't know, retweeted or something in an article I wrote on child labor. And, uh, and I briefly became, became famous as a child labor advocate. <laughs> <laughs> and people said, see, she wants to abolish the public schools and put all the kids in salt mines. I don't know anything about salt mines. It was probably not the worst job. I don't know. Probably better than public school. But, but anyway, people were calling me a monster. I mean, they were saying wicked things about me. They never met me. But they were certain that I was morally bankrupt and a disgraceful human being because of what I said. This happens to you. You know what you have to do? Say it anyway. You want to be disruptive? Be courageous. Say what's true and say it regardless of what your friend network on Facebook is going to say back to you. And get tough, you know? Uh, you can always ban people, you know? I've banned a lot of people, but you, know, you can't ban everybody who disagrees with you. Ultimately, you just kind of got to laugh. And here's the thing. The people who are fighting with you and insulting you and calling you names, at least they're paying attention to you, right? As Oscar Wilde said, the only thing worse than being talked about is not being talked about. So. Courageous, speak the truth. It's fun. You get trolled, we're in his badge of honor. Absence of Gnosticism, the difference between exoteric and esoteric. This is what you find all the time in politics. They say one thing in public and another thing in private. The beautiful thing about a, being a, a genuine classical liberal, a genuine liberal, is that you can have integration between what's in your heart and what comes out of your mind. That is a good life. No plots, no schemes, no conspiracies, no secret agendas, nothing. You don't have to get around with your friends, whisper to each other, you know. You can actually say what's true. I would encourage you. All right? You're at that age where, where, <laughs> where guys to get together and say shitty things about girls. You know, where blacks get together and say shitty things about whites and vice versa and so on. Genuine liberals can have an integrated view and unite your, what's in your heart with what comes out of your mouth. That is a great way to live. There's no secret teachings in liberalism. All we want is a world of freedom where every human being, without exception, has maximum op opportunity to experience genuine dignity in life. That's it. That's not complicated. It's not a conspiracy. It's not a secret teaching. It's just what we believe. And I feel great pride in believing it. Number 10. We celebrate progress and wealth and the rise and spread of human dignity. I mean, if I were going to sum up liberal doctrine in, in, in one phrase, that, that would be it. We are celebrators of progress. We believe in wealth. We don't sit around wishing we had been born in 1412 or thinking how great it was when everybody worked on farms. Or, 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 or wishing that every person had a factory job, or uh, regretting that uh, the great Cicero wasn't giving a speech, you know, uh, down at, you know, at, at the central square. You were born now for a reason. This is your world. You inhabit it because you have a mission. You've been placed here for a brief period of time, beginning, and it's got an end. Embrace your times, make them better. That's your job. You're architects of your own future. Celebrate progress. Celebrate now. Make the world a better place. Which gets us to 11, optimism about the future. We have every reason to be optimistic. Don't sit around bemoaning the state of the world. It's the worst thing about becoming a libertarian, right? You're like, well, I'll join a libertarian group, you know, on, uh, on uh, Facebook or something. Every post, every post. Well, look what the state did now. Well, look what the state did now. Because after, after a few days of this again, you know, I don't know, it seems like I was happier before I was a libertarian, you know? <laughs> this is really getting depressing, right? Like, avoid that. You know, look for the beautiful things in the world. I marvel, and I don't know, people don't always like to hang around me because I can't stop marveling about it. I mean, I go into Walmart and go, holy crap, I mean, they look at all this great stuff practically available for free. I mean, I get so excited in the home goods section of Walmart, I can't even believe it. You know, I'm in awe that the enterprise exists, that they're dumping all this amazing stuff on humanity, 
that anybody can come in and look at all these weird people in here. I mean, I'm glad for them, right? I'm glad for the people of Hall. Right? You know, I'm, I, I want to be happy when I, when I see the existence of freedom and how it works itself out in the world. And once you open your eyes and the scales fall from it, and you start to celebrate uh, 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 the, the future and, and the beauty all around you, you'll live a much happier life. Finally, uh, um, my 12 habits of liberal mind, confidence and freedom. You can have confidence that if we just make the world a freer place, things will improve. And people always want you to have a central plan. Oh yeah? How private streets gonna work? What are we gonna do about old age pensions? What are you gonna do about the disabled? You know, what about the mentally ill? Uh, what happens when marriages don't work? Who's gonna adjudicate that dispute? What about, you know, you can just endless, it's not a problem saying, you know, I don't entirely know, but I think we need an experimental system in which we can discover how this works. And the more you discover about freedom, the more confidence you get in it, actually. There's a community in Atlanta called Atlantic Station. And it was very interesting. It used to be a steel mill, and, and uh, the steel went away. So they built public housing. Thank you, urban development, you know. Uh, the, the center left of the 60s, they built public housing, and guess what? That became the most crime-infested you know, catastrophe you'd ever imagine. So they finally had to shut it down and blow up the buildings, and then the city just cordoned it off and said, all right, nobody can go here. There's something cursed about this plot of land. Nothing works. Until a great entrepreneur came along and said, well, I tell you what, why don't you sell it to me? And the city, the uh, government's are increasingly cynical and desperate for money these days. Great. And also, they don't have any ideas. So the, the city of Atlanta said, uh, that's fine by us. You want to buy? You want to buy? Yeah, you want to buy? You want to pay us for that? OK, fine. But we're not going to give you any streets. And the guy said, yeah, it's not a problem. I'll build it. Uh, we can't give you any parking. Yeah, that's all right. I'll dig underground and make parking. Uh, we're not going to provide you any police protection because we've had a lot of people die in this area. Fanny said, that's even better. <laughs> <laughs> And they said, and how are you going to zone it? The guy said, you know what? I'm not going to zone it. Just let, it, let things just happen. Mixed use. I'm going to live here. I'm going to open a store here. Whatever you want to do here is great. Yeah. So the result was Atlantic Station, two square miles in the middle of Atlanta. It's entirely private, private police. And I tell you, if you ever interact with private police, it's the greatest thing. You show up at Atlantic Station, you say, well, hello, officer. He says, well, it's very nice, very nice to see you. Listen, you seem like a man who enjoys a great cologne. I know Bloomingdale's today has a sale. You know, he's like advertising various products there. You know? It's just <laughs> fantastic. You know, they actually have an investment in your well-being because, you know, they've got a, a, a job that's very much connected with the commercial success of this community. Anyway, there's hotels there. There's, 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 there's you know, every kind of a, apartment. Uh, uh, every kind of store, and uh, there are no immigration controls, right? So you don't have to be a member. It's free migration. In fact, they're advertising for residents, advertising shoppers all the time. It's the most diverse, exciting, peaceful community ever. And you know what they do with people who misbehave? They ask them to leave. No tasers, no death, no guns, no clubbing. They say, it's time for you to go. We're banned from this community for a period of two weeks or whatever. Okay, they can't wait to get it back, right? Come back, behave, and buy them. Yeah. So who would have believed it? My point is, this is freedom. Who would have believed that this two square miles in the middle of Atlanta could have become such a magical, beautiful, happy, orderly, unbelievably prosperous community? You know what did it? It was freedom. Nobody could have predicted exactly how that was going to work. You let the creative human mind you know, be unleashed, let people solve their own problems, beautiful things are going to happen. You as liberals can have this confidence. All right, we're getting up to the end of the hour. Let me just say this, uh, folks. The reason I've gone at such length, I would like to see you, not based on my speech, but based on your reading, your study, as you develop, and your personalities and your character and your experienced life, and go to your classes and start pl plotting your future, to identify with liberalism, to think of yourself as a libertarian. Um, because, you know why? Because, not because a movement needs you, not because the SFL needs you, it's because civilization needs you. The progress of humanity needs your heart, your ideas, your mind, your love, your passion. It's all threatened right now. It's threatened from the left and the right. 
We need you. History needs you. Every human being who's not yet free desperately needs your hard work, your thinking, your writing. There is something that you can do to help this great cause. It's liberty that built civilization in the past. It's going to make the world more beautiful in the future. But only if we act, only if we understand, and only if you throw yourself into the great intellectual battle. Thank you very much for listening to me today.